it can admit of no doubt that increase Mather and his son, Cotton, did more than any other persons to aggravate the tendency of that age to the result reached in the witchcraft delusion of 1692. The latter, in the beginning of the sixth book of the Magnalia Christi Americana, refers to an attempt made, about the year 1658. Among some divines of no little figure throughout England, and Ireland, for the faithful registering of remarkable providences. But, alas it came to nothing that was remarkable. The like holy design, was, by the Reverend Increase Mather, proposed among the divines of New England, in the year 1681, at a general meeting of them, who thereupon desired him to begin and publish an essay, which he did in a little while, but therewithal declared that he did it only as a specimen of a larger volume, in hopes that this work being set on foot, posterity would go on with it. Cotton Mather did go on with it, immediately upon his entrance to the ministry, and by their preaching, publications, correspondence at home and abroad, and the influence of their learning, talents, industry, and zeal in the work, these two men promoted the prevalence of a passion for the marvelous and monstrous, and what was deemed preternatural, infernal, and diabolical, throughout the whole mass of the people, in England as well as America. The public mind became infatuated and, drugged with credulity and superstition, was prepared to receive every impulse of blind fanaticism. The stories, thus collected and put everywhere in circulation, were of a nature to terrify the imagination, fill the mind with horrible apprehensions, degrade the general intelligence and taste, and dethrone the reason. The effects of such publications were naturally developed in widespread delusions and universal credulity. They penetrated the whole body of society, and reached all the inhabitants and families of the land, in the towns and remotest settlements. In this way, the Mathers, particularly the younger, made themselves responsible for the diseased and bewildered state of the public mind, in reference in supernatural and diabolical agencies, which came to a head in the witchcraft delusion. Undoubtedly they thought they were doing God's service. But the influence they exercised, in this direction, remains nonetheless an historical fact. Increase Mather applied himself, without delay, to the prosecution of the design he had proposed, by writing to persons in all parts of the country, particularly clergymen, to procure, for publication, as many marvelous stories as could be raked up. He pursued this business with an industrious and pertinacious zeal, which nothing could slacken. After the rest of the world had been shocked out of such mischievous nonsense, by the horrid results at Salem, on the 5th of March, 1694, as president of Harvard College, he issued a circular to the reverend ministers of the gospel, in the several churches in New England, signed by himself and seven others, members of the corporation of that institution, urging it, as the special duty of ministers of the gospel, to obtain and preserve knowledge of notable occurrences, described under the general head of remarkables, and classified as follows. The things to be esteemed memorable are, especially, all unusual accidents, in the heaven, or earth, or water, all wonderful deliverances of the distressed, mercies to the godly, judgments to the wicked, and more glorious fulfillments of either the promises or the threatenings. To regard the illustrious displays of that providence, wherewith our Lord Christ governs the world, is a work than which there is none more needful or useful for a Christian, to record them is a work than which none more proper for a minister. Unaccountable, therefore, and inexcusable, is the sleepiness, even upon the most of good men throughout the world, which predisposes them to observe and, much more, to preserve, the remarkable dispensations of divine providence, towards themselves or others. Nevertheless there have been raised up, now and then, those persons, who have rendered themselves worthy of everlasting remembrance, by their wakeful zeal to have the memorable providences of God remembered through all generations. These passages show that the clergy, generally, were indifferent to the subject, and required to be aroused from neglect and sleepiness. Throughout the melancholy annals of the Church and the world, it has been the fountain of innumerable woes, convulsing nations, and desolating the earth. It is the duty of historians to trace it to its source, and, by depicting faithfully the causes that have led to it, prevent its recurrence. With these views, we must accept that the impression given to the popular sentiments of the period by certain leading minds, led to, was the efficient cause of, and may be said to have originated, the awful superstitions long prevalent in the old world and the new, and reaching a final catastrophe in 1692. Among these leading minds, 
aggravating and intensifying by their writings this most baleful form of the superstition of the age, increase and cotton mather stand most conspicuous. This opinion was entertained, at the time, by impartial observers. Francis Hutchinson, chaplain in ordinary to His Majesty, and minister of St. James's Parish, in St. Edmund's Bury, in the lifetime of both the Mathers, published, in London, an historical essay concerning witchcraft. In a chapter on the witchcraft in Salem, he attributes it to the influence of the writings of the Mathers. In the preface to the London edition of Cotton Mather's Memorable Providences, written by Richard Baxter, in 1690, he ascribes this same prominence to the works of the Mathers. While expressing the great value he attached to writings about witchcraft, and the importance, in his view, of that department of literature which relates stories about diabolical agency, possessions, apparitions, and the like, he says, Mr. Increase Mather hath already published many such histories of things done in New England, and this great instance published by his son, that is, the account of the Goodwin children cometh with such full convincing evidence, that he must be a very obdurate Sadducee that will not believe it. It is self-evident that by stimulating the clergy over the whole country to collect and circulate all sorts of marvelous and supposed preternatural occurrences, increase in Cotton Mather, considering the influence they naturally were able to exercise, are, particularly the latter, justly chargeable with, and may be said to have brought about, the extraordinary outbreaks of credulous fanaticism, exhibited in the cases of the Goodwin family and of the afflicted children, at Salem Village. The papers connected with the witchcraft examinations and trials, at Salem, show the extent to which currency had been given, in the popular mind, to such marvelous and prodigious things as the Mathers had been so long endeavoring to collect and circulate, particularly in the interior, rural settlements. The solitude of the woods were filled with ghosts, hobgoblins, specters, evil spirits, and the infernal prince of them all. Every pathway was infested with their flitting shapes and footprints, and around every hearthstone, shuddering circles, drawing closer together as the darkness of night thickened and their imaginations became more awed and frightened, listened to tales of diabolical operations. Besides such frightful fancies, other most unhappy influences flowed from the prevalence of the style of literature which the Mathers brought into vogue. Suspicions and accusations of witchcraft were everywhere prevalent, any unusual calamity or misadventure, every instance of real or affected singularity of deportment or behavior was attributed to the devil. Drake, in his History of Boston, says there were many cases of possession there, about the year 1688. Only one of them seems to have attracted the kind of notice requisite to preserve it from oblivion. That of the four children of John Goodwin, the eldest, thirteen years of age. The facts in the case are that the family lived in the south part of Boston. The father, a mason by occupation, was, as Mather informs us, a sober and pious man. From a statement made by Mr. Goodwin, some years subsequently, it seems that after one of his children had, for about a quarter of a year, been laboring under sad circumstances from the invisible world, he called upon the four ministers of Boston, together with his own pastor, to keep a day of prayer at his house. I thought of what David said. If he feared so to fall into the hands of men, oh? Then to think of the horrors of our condition, to be in the hands of devils and witches. Thus, our doleful condition moved us to call to our friends to have pity on us, for God's hand hath touched us. I was ready to say that no one's affliction was like mine. That my little house, that should be a little Bethel for God to dwell in, should be made a den for devils, that those little bodies, that should be temples for the Holy Ghost to dwell in, should be thus harassed and abused by the devil and his cursed brood. He says that Cotton Mather, with whom he had no previous acquaintance, was the last of the ministers that he spoke to on that occasion. Mather did not attend the meeting, but visited the house in the morning of the day, before the other ministers came, spent a half hour there, and prayed with the family. About three months after, the ministers held another prayer meeting there, Mr. Mather being present. He further stated that Mr. Mather never, in any way, suggested his prosecuting the old Irish woman for bewitching his children, nor gave him any advice in reference to the legal proceedings against her, but that the motion of going to the authority was made to him by a minister of a neighboring town. When Robert Calliff's book, of which we will speak later, reached this country, 
In 1700, a committee of seven was raised, at a meeting of the members of the parish of which the Mathers were ministers, to protect them against its effects. John Goodwin was a member of it, and contributed the certificate from which extracts have just been made. It was so worded as to give the impression that Cotton Mather did not take a leading part in the case of Goodwin's children in 1688. It states, as has been seen, that he was the last of the ministers asked to attend the prayer meeting, but lets out the fact that he was the first to present himself, going to the house and praying with the family before the rest arrived. In an account of the affair, written by this same John Goodwin, and printed by Mather, in London, ten years before, in the memorable providences relating to witchcraft and possessions, a somewhat different position is assigned to Mather. After saying the ministers did often visit us, he mentions Mr. Mather particularly. In 1690, Mather was willing to have Goodwin place him in the foreground of the picture, representing him as pulling the children out of the hand of the devil. In 1700, it was expedient to withdraw him into the background, and Goodwin, accordingly, provided the committee, of which he was a member, with a certificate of a somewhat different color and tenor. The execution of the woman, Glover, on the charge of having bewitched these Goodwin children, is one of the most atrocious passages of our history. Hutchinson wrote in his History of Massachusetts that she was one of the wild Irish, and appeared to be disordered in her senses. She was a Roman Catholic, unable to speak the English language, and evidently knew not what to make of the proceedings against her. In her dying hour, she was understood by the interpreter to say that taking away her life would not have any effect in diminishing the sufferings of the children. The remark, showing more sense than any of the rest of them had, was made to bear against the poor old creature, as a diabolical imprecation. Between the time of her condemnation and that of her execution, Cotton Mather took the eldest Goodwin child into his family, and kept her there all winter. He has told the story of her extraordinary doings, in a style of blind and absurd credulity that cannot be surpassed. Speaking of Mather's book, Dr. Hutchinson says, The judgment I made of it was, that the poor old woman, being an Irish papist, and not ready in the signification of English words, had entangled herself by a superstitious belief, and doubtful answers about saints and charms, and seeing what advantages Mr. Mather made of it, I was afraid I saw part of the reasons that carried the cause against her. And first it is manifest that Mr. Mather is magnified as having great power over evil spirits. Then his grandfather's and father's books have gained a testimony, that, upon occasion, may be improved one knows not how far. For among the many experiments that were made, Mr. Mather would bring to this young maid, the Bible, the Assembly's Catechism, his grandfather Cotton's Milk for Babes, his father's remarkable providences, and a book to prove that there were witches, and when any of these were offered for her to read in, she would be struck dead, and fall into convulsions. This language, published by Dr. Hutchinson, in England, during the lifetime of the Mathers, shows how strong was the opinion, at that time, that the writings of those two divines were designed and used to promote the prevalence of the witchcraft superstition, and especially that such was the effect, as well as the purpose, of Cotton Mather's publication of the case of the Goodwin children, in the same connection, Hutchinson says, Observe the time of the publication of that book, and of Mr. Baxter's. Mr. Mather's came out in 1690, and Mr. Baxter's the year after, and Mr. Mather's father's remarkable providences had been out before that, and, in the year 1692, the frights and fits of the afflicted, and the imprisonment and execution of witches in New England, made as sad a calamity as a plague or a war. I know that Mr. Mather, in his late folio, imputes it to the Indians sending their spirits among them, but I attribute it to Mr. Baxter's book, and his, and his father's, and the false principles, and frightful stories, that filled the people's minds with great fears and dangerous notions. In this connection, it may be remarked that had it not been for the interference of the ministers, it is quite likely that the sad circumstances from the invisible world, in the Goodwin family, would never have been heard of. It is quite certain that similar circumstances, in the Reverend Paris's family, in 1692, owed their general publicity and their awful consequences, to the meetings of ministers called by him. If the girls, in either case, had been let alone, they would soon have been weary of what one of them called their sport, and the whole thing would have been swallowed, with countless stories of haunted houses and second sight, in deep oblivion. 
in considering Cotton Mather's connection with the case of the Goodwin children, and that of the accusing girls, justice to him requires that the then prevalent notions of the power and pending alarm of the kingdom of darkness, should be borne in mind. It was believed by divines generally, and by people at large, that here, in the American wilderness, a mighty onslaught upon the Christian settlements was soon to be made by the devil and his infernal hosts, and that, on this spot, the final battle between Satan and the church, was shortly to come off. This belief had taken full possession of Mather's mind, and fired his imagination. And it must further be borne in mind that, up to the time of the case of the Goodwin children, he had entertained the idea that the devil was to be met and subdued by prayer. That, and that only, was the weapon with which he girded himself, and with that he hoped and believed to conquer. For this reason, he did not advise Goodwin to go to the law. For this reason, he labored in the distressed household in exercises of prayer, and took the eldest child into his own family, so as to bring the battery of prayer, with a continuous bombardment, upon the devil by whom she was possessed. For this reason, he persisted in praying in the cell of the old Irish woman, much against her will, for she was a stubborn Catholic. Of course, he could not pray with her, for he had no doubt she was a confederate of the devil, and she had no disposition to join in prayer with one whom, as a heretic, she regarded in no better light. Hutchinson regarded Mather's printed account of the case of the Goodwin children as having a very important relation to the immediately subsequent delusion in Salem. The eldest was taken into a minister's family, where at first she behaved orderly, but after some time suddenly fell into her fits. The account of her sufferings is in print, some things are mentioned as extraordinary, which tumblers are every day taught to perform, others seem more than natural, but it was a time of great credulity. The printed account was published with a preface by Mr. Baxter. It obtained credit sufficient, together with other preparatives, to dispose the whole country to be easily imposed upon, by the more extensive and more tragical scene, which was presently after acted at Salem and other parts of the county of Essex. After mentioning several works published in England, containing which stories, which trials, etc., he proceeds. All these books were in New England, and the conformity between the behavior of Goodwin's children, and most of the supposed bewitched at Salem, and the behavior of those in England, is so exact, as to leave no room to doubt the stories had been read by the New England persons themselves, or had been told to them by others who had read them. Indeed this conformity, instead of giving suspicion, was urged in confirmation of the truth of both. The Old England demons, and the new being so much alike. It thus appears that the opinion was entertained, in England and this country, that the notoriety given to the case of the Goodwin children, especially by Mather's printed account of it, had an efficient influence in bringing on the tragic scene, shortly afterwards exhibited at Salem. This opinion is shown to have been correct, by the extraordinary similarity between them. The Salem case, in 1692, was, in fact, a substantial repetition of the Boston case, in 1688. On this point, we have the evidence of Cotton Mather himself. The Rev. John Hale of Beverly, who was as well qualified as any one to compare them, having lived in Charlestown, which place had been the residence of the Goodwin family, and been an active participator in the prosecutions at Salem. In his book, entitled, A Modest Inquiry into the Nature of Witchcraft, written in 1697, but not printed until 1702, after mentioning the fact that Cotton Mather had published an account of the conduct of the Goodwin children, and briefly describing the manifestations and actions of the Salem girls, says, I will not enlarge in the description of their cruel sufferings, because they were, in all things, afflicted as bad as John Goodwin's children at Boston in the year 1688, as he that will read Mr. Mather's book on remarkable providences may read part of what these children, and afterwards sundry grown persons, suffered by the hand of Satan at Salem Village and parts adjacent, anno 1692. On the relation of this instance of alleged witchcraft, in a locality so near as Boston and Salem, and with so short an interval of time, general considerations would ordinarily be regarded as sufficient. The intercommunication between the places was, even then, so constant, that no important event could happen in one without being known in the other. By the thousand channels of conversation and rumor, and by Mather's printed account, endorsed by Baxter, and put into circulation throughout the country, 
the details of the alleged sufferings and extraordinary doings of the Goodwin children, must have become well known, such a conclusion would be formed, if no particular evidence in support of it could be adduced, but when corroborated by Hutchinson, Hale, and in effect, by Mather himself, it cannot be shaken. The protracted trial of the supposed witch, however, patiently persevered in for several long months, when he had every advantage, in his own house, to pray the devil out of the eldest of the children, resulting in her becoming more and more saucy, insolent, and outrageous, may have undermined his faith to an extent of which he might not have been wholly conscious. He says, in concluding his story in the Magnalia, that, after all other methods had failed. One particular minister, taking particular compassion on the family, set himself to serve them in the methods prescribed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Accordingly, the Lord being besought thrice, in three days of prayer, with fasting on this occasion, the family then saw their deliverance perfected. It is worthy of reflection, whether it was not the fasting, that seems to have been especially enforced on this occasion, and for three days, that cured the girl. A similar application had before operated as a temporary remedy. Mather tells us, in his memorable providences, referring to a date previous to the three days fasting. Mr. Morton, of Charlestown, and Mr. Allen, Mr. Moody, Mr. Willard, and myself, of Boston, with some devout neighbors, kept another day of prayer at John Goodwin's house, and we had all the children present with us there. The children were miserably tortured, while we labored in our prayers, but our good God was nigh unto us, in what we called upon him for. From this day, the power of the enemy was broken, and the children, though assaults after this were made upon them, yet were not so cruelly handled as before. It must have been a hard day for all concerned. Five ministers and any number of good praying people, as Goodwin calls them, together with his whole family, could not but have crowded his small house. Fasting was added to the prayers, that were kept up during the whole time, the ministers relieving each other. If the fasting had been continued three days, it is not unlikely that the cure of the children would, then, have proved effectual and lasting. The account given in the Memorables and the Magnalia, of the conduct of these children, under the treatment of Mather and the other ministers, is, indeed, most ludicrous, and no one can be expected to look at it in any other light. He was forewarned that in printing it, he would expose himself to ridicule. He tells us that the mischievous, but bright and wonderfully gifted, girl, the eldest of the children, getting, at one time, possession of his manuscript, pretended to be, for the moment, incapacitated, by the devil, for reading it, and he further informs us. She hectored me at a strange rate for the work I was at, and threatened me with I know not what mischief for it. She got a history I was writing of this witchcraft, and though she had, before this, read it over and over, yet now she could not read, I believe, one entire sentence of it, but she made of it the most ridiculous travesty in the world, with such an excess of fancy, to supply the sense that she put upon it, as I was amazed at. And she particularly told me, that I should quickly come to disgrace by that history. Nothing is more true than that, in estimating the conduct and character of men, allowances must be made for the natural, and almost necessary, influence of the opinions and customs of their times. But this excuse will not wholly shelter Mather. He and his father thus are answerable, more than almost any other men have been, for the opinions of their time. It was, indeed, a superstitious age, but made much more so by their operations, influence, and writings, beginning with Increase Mather's movement, at the Assembly of the Ministers, in 1681, and ending with Cotton Mather's dealings with the Goodwin children, and the account thereof which he printed and circulated, far and wide. Cotton Mather originally relied only upon prayer in his combat with satanic powers. But the time was at hand when other weapons than the sword of the spirit were to be drawn in that warfare.